Uh, no, I did. I actually didn't choose these musicians. Just they were chosen by the festival promoters, and uh, fortunately for me, they were, for the most part, musicians I had been associated with, and uh, you know we had an instantaneous uh, musical rapport. You know. And you brought you brought some charts down that they looked over yeah. prior to the playing. Yeah, and get comfortable with. It usually yeah. takes a, a few sets to get comfortable with the tunes. Like that, I would imagine. Well, yeah, but that's a matter of degrees. It's it's relative because uh, you know it depends on how good the musicians are, and the audience sometimes might not. If, if the musicians are really good as they were, they might not know. Well, hey, these musicians have never seen these tunes before. Mm -hmm. yeah. But there's something sometimes like that where, where since it's so spontaneous, mm -hmm. things can happen. I yeah, imagine, yeah, that, pretty this, dramatically. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so we, we, you know, we had a good time playing this uh, this week here. Have you got out around the island here at all? A little bit. I went to uh, the marina, mm -hmm. and I went to Pigeon Island, and uh, I was out in the water, and that's that's just about it. <laughs> right, you pretty fascinating place. Oh yes, it is. Yeah, it's beautiful here. You know, whether performing solo with trio or larger ensemble, you instinctively adapt beautifully. What factors have contributed to you becoming such a well-rounded performer? Well, um, I think those pianists uh, who have been uh, examples for me, great examples for me, have been um, guys who perform well either in all of those situations or just very well in one of those situations. So, for instance, uh, I'm, a, I'm a great admirer of Wynton Kelly and Herbie Hancock, mm -hmm. who were great accompanists as well as great soloists. But I'm also a big fan of um, uh, Oscar Peterson, who's a great trio player. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Uh, so, you know, I, I've tried to uh, be that kind of adaptable musician. Well, you come to Toronto quite often to play solo. And that's another thing that's very difficult, especially for somebody moving from a trio or a yeah, locker ensemble. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you know, that's I've I've paid a lot of attention over the years to people like Art Tatum and and uh, Oscar Peterson solo, Bud Powell, and uh, but I mean that's not something that I do all the time. So w when I have an engagement like that, sometimes it takes me two or three nights to get you know to get primed and going. You said find sometimes that can be a scary experience if you had no time to really prepare oh, for it. Oh, most definitely. Because you know all yeah. ears are... Yeah, all you're all alone there. out there. And <laughs> now, how do pianists from the South differ, differ stylistically from those from the North and, and uh, West Coast? Well, actually, I don't know if there's a general difference. Mm -hmm. You know, I, uh, you know, I mean, for instance... Um, you may find that pianists in Birmingham, Alabama sound nothing like pianists in Memphis, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. um, I just think it's, it's a matter of, um, uh, of um, sort of a trend, uh, for the lack of a better word, in what's going on in that area at the right. time. For instance, um, musically, uh, I had a lot of experience in Memphis, Tennessee. And... Um, Whereas many cities may not have a sort of fatherly piano figure, Memphis had one by the name of Phineas Newborn. Right. So you might find that many of the pianists there uh, may have something of his style or sound in their playing, but um, that's just Memphis. In Nashville, they may not have such a figure. Um, you also have James Williams. Well, James Williams, yes, but. Uh, you know, we were all influenced by everybody else. I mean, we were all influenced by Herbie and McCoy. That's right. And, uh, you know, and those people have been influences, whether you, whether a young pianist live in Denver or Omaha or Portland, you know. They're always yeah. available. On, on yeah. The so I, I wouldn't say that there's, there might be a general difference among Southern pianists and, you know, across the Southern, you know, just straight across the board. But you may, in some sp spots like Memphis, you may have where um, at least the pianists that, that the world knows, they may have maybe a somewhat bluesier approach or whatever. You know. Well, you know, like uh, Wynton was more like a cosmopolitan kind of a player. And then when he went back to uh, 
really dug into the New Orleans stuff, something new evolved out of his writing and stuff, you know, and sometimes, you know, certain areas, I know Memphis stacks both. I mean, I mean, it has a long history, rhythm and blues, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, this tradition. Now, do you have a gospel background? Somewhat, yes. Somewhat? Yes, yes. Yeah, and, I, play, I play gospel. Yeah. And uh, some players have no connection with the blues. Do you think it's essential to have a background in the blues? Some like to just totally not have any of that in their plan or... Um, well, I, I can't say whether it, it's essential, or, but um, blues has, has been historically essential in, in great jazz players. And um, to me, it's, it's a big part of, of, of the jazz feeling, and the jazz language. So for me, it is essential. Mm-hmm. Do you have background in European classical music? Somewhat. Yeah, uh, just mm-hmm. at the yeah. earlier years. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. um, do you have a set of preparatory exercises for warming up? Yeah. Can mm-hmm. you uh, share some of it with us? With, with um, <clears throat> well, I don't have. I never have a chance to warm up before a gig, but I do have. Uh, I, you know, practice a uh, sort of uh, practice regime that I go through every day at home, and that is. Um, I practice a set of exercises by Isidore Philippe and um, scales, basically. And after I finish that, I just play. You're on your own. Well, the two, uh, between classical and between jazz, there's two different techniques involved. Now, how do you overcome problems with fingering? Uh, that's, that's a big, big part of playing any, whether jazz or classical music. Yeah, well, it's it's just uh, that you you take a, a particular musical musical idea, and you it, just like you would if if you came across a, a classical so-called fingering, I mean a classical figure, you just sit and work at it and figure out try to figure out what's the best fingering for that figure, mm-hmm. you know, and but basically, you know, your fingering is has developed, you know, your technical your technique. And your fingering system has developed along with your vocabulary. So, uh, uh, for the most part, you know you've developed you've developed the fingering for what it is you're hearing in your head. You know the language of what you speak. So, usually they, they go kind of hand in hand. Well, I say, I've noticed some piano players will play more even more flat finger. Yeah. You know. I yeah, don't, yeah, yeah. Is that more of a sound thing? Is that? Or is that just... I don't think so. I think that's just the way some pianists yeah. evolve. I mean, you look know. at Errol Gardner. Yeah. And he, he, I mean, he gets the full range of the piano. Uh-huh. Yeah, but for some people, they would say, hey, technically, that's incorrect. But there is... I don't... Well, no, no because really Horowitz right. played kind of flat finger. He sure did, didn't yeah. he? And so, I, you know, that's just the way I, I, a particular pianist develops his technique. Uh, uh, I don't think there's any correct way to play the piano. What works and gives you what? Yeah, that's that's it. Now you perform, you've performed and recorded prolifically as both leader and sideman. Do you find it a bit disconcerting being labeled a newcomer? Yes. I mean, it's, I'm down here and it's like newcomer. Yes. And I mean, yes. I've been listening to your records for a long time. Yes. Well, you see, but the, the, but the thing is, jazz fans know that I'm not a newcomer. Right. It's often uh, the promoters and this and that. But you know, I guess there's a certain kind of. Uh, Glamour, if you will, that comes with being announced as a newcomer, you know, <laughs> especially if you can be viewed as someone very young, which is getting more and more harder for me. This <laughs> was pretty incredible because there's Bobby Watson, Ray Drummond, Victor Lewis, guys like this who have all yeah. sort of bridged the gap right. between until the record labels pounced on all the right. all, all the young guys. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you seem to still steer clear of computers and synthesizers. Do you find them a distraction? Uh, I don't find them at all. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I, I, at this point in my career and uh, my development, I don't see that I have a need for them, a musical yeah. and artistic need for them. Now, what do you tell people who have a hard time comprehending jazz? Um, what, what should they listen for? I mean, I. this is done... As a magazine, we try to open up people's minds, and sometimes they come here and they say to me, like, you know, as we go around in the different venues, they'll hear a Naji, and Naji is easy to take, mm-hmm. you know, but yet they want us to take that depth step farther. How do you get them to open up? Well, I, that's a that's a strange question because 
I never really try to get people to understand jazz. Yeah. I just play it. Right. And uh, those, you know, I mean, my, my attitude generally is, um, you know, he that hath the ear, let them hear, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but um, I, you know, it, it just, it seems that the people who like jazz and who appreciate jazz are people who appreciate the process of music, uh, who mm -hmm. appreciate what, what making music and what music is about. And usually that has happened through a process of education or mm -hmm. a personal culture or commun communal, you know, community culture. And if a person has not had that, then it's it's difficult to tell them where to start, you know. He's going to have a limited scope. Yeah. I mean, uh, if, if, you know, when you talk to somebody who really appreciates jazz, they practically know, well, you know, there's a pretty melody, you know, the harmonies sound great, or at least, at least they can get to the feeling, you know. But um, I don't know. I don't know where to tell people to start, and I, I really, you know, I, I can't. I don't spend much time doing that because, you know, my thing is just performing. That takes up a lot of yeah. time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah.